Netflix, and the MPAA generally. Today, I have a guest, as is becoming hopefully increasingly normal well, with this show, uh, Devin Oxman. Are you still there? I'm still here. Devin has been on the show before, so some of you may recognize him from a previous episode around June. And so, it's off the bat, how have you been, Devin? I've been good. This has been an interesting year. Um, and just to, to, to specify, that was June of last year. Oh, June so of last year, okay. It's been quite a while, which is okay, but as for all of us, very kind of interesting year. Yeah. And time is definitely blurring together and a time little more is than usual. Blurring, yeah, time is speeding up and slowing down in parallel, which makes for very odd days. So given that that would have been then before this whole COVID thing started, what has been your COVID experience so far? Well, my COVID experience in these times, I'm lucky enough to have been doing a master's. And so as a student, not a lot has changed. I'm lucky enough that I know a lot of people who work in the service industry who, who lost jobs, who have serious income deficiencies. I was just working on mostly the basis this year. So, so, so you, you from... probably should be isolating a little bit and focusing on just your computer screen, your books, that sort of thing, rather than... Well, exactly. I mean, I was already doing that before the pandemic, so in some ways not a lot changed, but in other ways everything has changed. But I feel like I'm in a lucky position relative to what a lot of people have had for an experience in these times. So I have no complaints. I mean, we're lucky to live in 2020 where we all have supercomputers in our pockets video chat with friends and neighbors and like imagining as I often say having a visual impairment growing up 40 years ago I would have been fucked you know to put it bluntly like no GPS much less access to information IT and, and kind of the computer revolution has or technology in general has made my life a lot more kind of easy than it might have been 40, 50 years ago right. and I think in the same respect um, the, the access to technology we have has made this kind of lockdown and this quarantine and pandemic in some ways easier than it might have been in previous eras. And not just for supercomputer for keeping in contact and doing things like this and actually having social contact, which is very important these days, but also for understanding the world around us. Yeah, for having access to information. I mean, now, access to information is not as easy that it might work. One might think it is, given, you know, the shitloads of misinformation and the conspiracy and the, whole, you know, the, the difficulties we're having with our social network. But it still is uh, an amazing resource that I think people sometimes, like, you see a lot of angst about the, the lockdowns and the pandemic, and justifiably so. We're social creatures. This is hard for everyone. But one takes a step back for a moment and goes, the access to information, the access to communications that we have at our fingertips nowadays is kind of incredible and let us not forget that this can be a lot harder and for some in the world it's, it is not right. everyone has a wi-fi and, and a tablet and a computer and a phone in their house and, and even things like uh, as we were running into difficulties trying to get this show up and running we've discovered that jitsi the voice and video alternative to Zoom that I have been touting to the world to use turns out to be virtually unusable by the blind, right? Yeah, so, well, at least on iOS. I don't right. know how, for, how they program their Android app, but the other iOS app is completely inaccessible. On the iOS, given the fact that if you use the standard UI kit, like the, you know, the APIs that are built into the software stack to build your application, it's pretty difficult to make the application inaccessible. That's one of the advantages of 
there are plenty of disadvantages to a very closed and locked down development environment and application kind of framework system. This is one of the advantages, is that you have to work really hard to make your app become inaccessible. So I congratulate the developers of Jitsi. They have performed an amazing feat here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I say that in jest. I mean, it, it's something that not people don't necessarily test for, you know. And unless you run unit tests for every possible exception out there, it's, it's not necessarily something that a normal developer thinks of. Exactly. And so kind of speaking a little bit about the Apple ecosystem, we were kind of talking a little bit before we started here about a court case that's apparently going on right this week. Yeah, Epic has sued both Apple and Android, or Google rather, kind of concerning their administrations of, of their app stores within these locked down environments. Because I mean, this is the new model for both iOS and Android is that you've got a very closed Scarily provisioned software environment in which only signed code that has been downloaded from their systems can run on the device. Now, people will say, well, what about side loading? And if you're not familiar with the term, it's the practice of downloading into an app directly off the web and running it, which is possible. And, and, and this is how things used to work. In, this is how everything used to work. Everything right? 20 years ago used to work that you would download at best from a non sketchy, non anonymous yeah. Eastern European website or company, and then you would install the program yourself on your computer, or maybe yeah. have your IT department do it. Whereas now we have these app stores, we have these yeah. confined environments where at least some thought has gone into, is this app or program safe? Is it actually yeah. going to rip off all of the customer's credit card numbers who yeah. use it, that sort of thing? Yeah. This, and the, this wasn't oh the God, case sorry. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was a total shot in the dark. And yeah. e even in places which you would think that there would be a security mindset for, there's sketchy Russian code running in the background somewhere. Well, there's sketchy code from all over the planet, because I'm sure plenty of NSA code, too. Oh, yeah. Like, and that's the thing, that's the crapshoot. And, and let us not forget that you said 20 years ago, things used to work that way. And in, the, in desktop computing environments, they still do. Right. You know, if you run Linux, you run Windows, you run Mac or you still have these options available to you. Right. Now, they've mitigated this by having automatic built-in malware so that if there is a particularly egregious piece of code, it does get blocked at the system level. But this is still the way that, that applications on these desktop or laptop, whatever you want to call it, computing environments work. Now, the only problem with that is that anybody born past 1990 probably has never used anything but a, a phone or a tablet. Right. And so these launch down ecosystems are the new kind of form for computing. And Again, in some ways, this is a very good thing. Um, I think it was, I, I'm trying to think where, where I remember hearing it, I think it was on one of the Birch, their, one of their podcasts, and somebody, I think it was Neil Patel, was saying, you know, one of the reasons I buy my parents' iPhones is because they can't buy it up. And, you know, it's safe for them to put their credit card into it. And, I mean, these stakes are higher for mobile devices that have access to your GPS location, that have access to a microphone and a camera in your pocket that is with you every day. Right. So the stakes are higher for security. And that is the argument for these lockdown environments. And it's a good argument. I'm not. And, but of and, course, and even as someone who's, like, really generally hostile against Apple and less so against Android, you're absolutely correct on that side. Like, this is a, a wall that has been built, like the Great Wall of China or something, where, like, there was a reason why that wall was yeah. built. Like Now, I mean, some of the reasons that, it, you know, the applications of the wall now are becoming anti-competitive, right? right? It's not the building of the wall that was the problem, it's what has been done with the wall. I mean, as with so many things, you know, it wasn't the law that was passed, it was how it was interpreted over the next 20 years of court cases. It wasn't the, the, the policing practices that were a problem, it was that they didn't change in the ensuing three decades. Like, so many things work this way. Right. There, was, there was a good reason that these practices were put in place at the outset. Taxes never go down, or rather rarely. Like, so, you know, to get back to the main kind of summary of what was happening there, so Epic, which is a games company, they wanted to, to brief, they wanted to offer their own goods for sale within their application. They didn't want to go through these app stores payment processors. Because which, which, which part of that, I think, is the, the question of how to make games sustainable. 
as yes. a business yeah. model, and yeah. which I'm sure they're looking at other industries. I just listened to a Canada yeah. Land podcast right before the show where they were talking about basically the collapse of journalism in Canada. And yeah. the games industry must be looking at that going, you know, yeah. with this digital environment where everyone is in the, these walled gardens, everyone's connected yeah. all the time, yeah. businesses are just getting decimated who cannot well, that, yeah, it. Yeah, when you have that 30% cut, uh, that's huge. That's that's like the difference between two more developers on a project or like that's a huge revenue cut. And that is and, what Apple and Android? Or is it yes, yes, just yeah. Apple? Because I know Apple, both sides you know, kind Apple of take Apple was the first app store and they started it. Everyone Everyone has consulted around it and said, right. whether it's the Xboxes, whether it's you know, Android, but, you know, all these markets have consolidated around a 30% cut. I mean, they didn't technically collude, but they might as well. Have. Right. So that's a huge, huge overhead. Uh, you look at markets with property co uh, function competition, like you know, credit card markets, for, for example. Well, the payment processing rates, you know, you look at something like Stripe, they're like 2-3% yeah. because you have meaningful competition. But when you have a locked down environment like this where, like, you want to run a piece of code on... Now, like I said, on Android, it's a little... You can, you can download apps. Google makes it as difficult and as scary as possible to do so. You know, like, you were downloading something off the internet, this could fry your device, this could spy on you. If you run this outside of our app store, we have no guarantee. We can't give you any guarantees. And again, these warnings are put in place for good reasons because 90% of people have no clue what the hell they're doing on the internet. And, and it's and actually probably even the higher than 90%. Like, sure, I'm <laughs> but I mean, yeah. these warnings were put in place for for legitimately good, or, you know, security reasons. But they do also then have the side function of really steering people back in towards that app store where Google takes their perhaps makes all the rules. And I mean, this has been going on kind of this has been brewing for a while. The EU has been. Uh, has investigations launched into kind of competition on these closed app stores. And as um, does and, the United States, and as yeah, does and Canada. Trust, there was a hearing, there was a hearing uh, by the House uh, Antitrust Committee two weeks ago, and, and that was mostly a lot of grandstanding. There were some useful things that kind of accomplished at it, but I mean, everyone knew exactly what was going to be asked, what evidence had been kind of unearthed beforehand, but it needed to happen. It's like it's part of the performance of government. Of yeah. Yeah. But that's the performance, exactly. Of and this, so, this has been brewing for a while. I mean, Epic, when they, like what they did, they did a hilarious thing because, of course, what they did is they updated their apps outside of the store. They just did some server side changes and allowed direct payments to purchase goods in the apps. Now, when they did that, they knew that both Google and Apple, their first response was going to be to kick them off the app stores. So, so, so this is a, an app that probably tens of millions, if not hundreds of oh, millions of people use. Fortnite is used by hundreds of millions of people around the world, if not billions. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's certainly it's pushing. Massive, it's massive. huge. Yeah, and now they knew exactly what they were doing. This was pre-planned. They knew they would be kicked off the app store. The second that those apps were discontinued from the store, like within two hours, they had launched their lawsuits with the FTC about unfair monopoly practices. They had a slick, produced video mocking Apple in their classic way that Apple in 1984 mocked IBM. <laughs> their famous commercial. They basically did a one-for-one -one recut of that, casting Apple and as kind of the IBM standard. They, I, I, they published I'm, it I'm just like reminded of the, there's like a Saturday morning breakfast cartoon yeah. where it's like first they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win then you laugh at them. And it's kind of like a cycle in that sense, where like yeah. you, you start as the and, outsider, yeah. you become the, the status quo, and then the outsiders yeah. start challenging you. And we are at the yeah. outsiders start challenging Apple phase of that cycle yeah. right now. And Google too. Probably. And Google, yeah. But I mean, they also, they launched the video right within the Fortnite world, so like millions of people. Like, And who, how to really win the PR battle is like, Tell a bunch of teenagers that your game is going to be you're never going to be allowed an update for your game again. Right, and, I mean, and the other thing didn't. too is that, like, when we think about maybe 40, 50 years ago, when Apple did that particular commercial, the main media that people got their information from would have been television. Television yeah. was the king, and yeah. if you had some disruptive change that you were going to conduct in society, you would start, yeah. or at least you would try, to, to pass it through the filters of the people yeah. who control the medium of television. Yeah, now, they watch the, it on the Super Bowl. Right, exactly. And so now, one of the biggest media environments, period, is Fortnite. It exactly. Is, I mean, and especially this year, right? Yeah. Well, especially. right, because everyone's self-isolated, right? Because so everyone is at home. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no, no school. happening within this world. Like, this is... 
basically the, or at least our most modern, up-to-date kind of incarnation of Stevenson's metaverse. Like, right. We're not there yet, but this is the first crack at it. Well, I guess Second Life wasn't the first crack. I mean, Active this Worlds was kind of before Second Life. And, well, sure, and but I, I mean, the, the first one that was kind of, like, I would say, you know, large scale. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of ones, but no, Fortnite is huge. So, I mean, this was all very much, this was all a, a coordinated act. And, and the other thing, too, is because act. Fortnite then is that an epic thing? Yeah. So, I mean, epic controls the media. And it yeah. can functionally lock Apple out of being able to respond on that particular media. So, like, yeah. the playing field on that side is super tilted against Apple, but Apple can't complain about that, right? Because the no. moment they do that, then the, they've won, basically. Or Epic has won. Epic has won, because yeah. they, they, exactly, they've succeeded in manipulating them into saying, to criticizing the lockdown environment. Right. And it's like, well, what, what do you offer a lockdown environment? Uh, so it's, yeah, we were talking about this a little bit because I think it's really interesting. And these app stores are monopolistic, and both Apple and Google are definitely using them to kind of shore up their own kind of dominance within markets. Absolutely. I, I, I would say, given some of the reporting that's come out over the last couple of years, years given the antitrust hearings, given some of the work that the EU has done, I would say that that is not even up for dispute. Right. It may have been malicious, it may have just been, again, like a function of once the system is in place, it's hard not to abuse it, which is why, I mean, so many did civil liberty advocates worry so much about cameras and databases and stuff, because it's not the purpose that the, that the data is collected for that is the problem, it's the unintended secular consequence. Right, and, and basically one of the things that has come out over the past 30 or 40 years is that you can pretty much guarantee that if data is collected and is recorded, that... Yeah. I mean, with some like very, very minor exceptions, it's going to be used for, even if not misused, just used for something different than it was yeah. originally intended. That yeah. The temptation yeah. is so great. And yeah, the only, the only way to mitigate that is not to collect in the first place. Right. Uh, I mean, there, um, there's probably a way to do it with something like, Z Z what is it, ZK Snarks or Advanced, advanced Frickin' Crypto. But, well, yes, or, or differential privacy. Like yeah. there are ways of there are ways there are ways of anonymizing the data. But I mean, as has been shown time and time again, neural networks and kind of a lot of machine learning has become very good at re-aggregating that data back into its constituent patterns. Like exactly. even with we're not good at large data sets. We're not good at mulling over how they should be structured, and we're not good at seeing we're, we miss patterns in the data. Like we think we've 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 disaggregated them and made them anonymous because our brains just don't work at that level. And we've it's been shown time and time again that given the right tools, that data just it lives forever. It's like you know, these those have forever chemicals, right? I mean, you know yeah. there was an interesting article a couple of weeks back, um in they were talking about how they're going to really protect and create symbols that generations from now are going to know from some of these nuclear um spent fuel storage sites because these things will be hot for 300,000 years. Yeah. And how do you tell a generate humans 100,000 years in the future that obviously have not the same language as us? I mean, hopefully they have the technology. And, and, and for so people no. who are like thinking of like, how do I conceptualize this problem? Like think yeah. about just cursive writing. Yeah. Like how many people under 25 say can even read cursive writing? Yeah. And if I would say all, very few. Yeah. So all yeah. within a generation, that whole corpus yeah. of written yeah. documents is dot. And if we anything yeah. that is written in cursive right now that is not being copied and not being put into some other format where it can be understood, it is gone within a hundred years, like yeah, it's gone. at most. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now I mean, there's there's always kind of the academy, the academy and scholarships to bring that back. I mean, we are still trying to piece together texts from thousands of years ago, but right. that's an arduous process. And with the volume of data being produced nowadays, that's not necessarily feasible right. either. So, I mean, the, the thing that I thought about that was really interesting about this was that the logical response would be to say how antitrust regulation come in and either separate these app stores from their constituent companies and, and, and break them up like they broke up Bell right. and have them run as their own external systems or mandate ways of allowing third-party coach to run on these devices. And on the one hand, I'm all for that because, again, I need to buy a new computer this fall. And for quite a while, I thought about going with an iPad Pro instead of another laptop. And honestly, the more that you look at the idea that you can't run any kind of code external to the app store on the device, the more uneasy it doesn't feel like a computer. 
And that's also for you as well. Like I have more than a couple of times in my life now given a computer to a friend or a family member or set them up with a, even Linux, which in principle you should be able to install code on, but because yeah. of the barriers involved, basically they were not able to do it. And yeah, it was yeah. loaded with stuff they should have been able to do an awful lot with thinking ahead what they would need. Yeah. You got your email, you got your office, you got your web browser, you got games. You, you can load it yeah. with thousands and thousands of different tools for thousands and thousands of use cases. But at the end of the day, reality throws stuff at you all the time. Yeah. And you know, I mean, look, six months ago, nobody had heard of Zoom. Yeah. And your relative needs to install Zoom on it because they need to have a Zoom call over there for the boss. Well, right. Or their city council. Exactly. There, there yeah. are now parts of government that are purely run on Zoom, including the federal yeah. government of Canada. Like, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you, it is getting very close to the point where if you don't use Zoom, you are cut off, cut off from our democracy. You are no yeah, longer a citizen yeah. of this yeah, country, really. functionally. Yeah, you you're cut off functionally from your state. Yeah, and that's... And that's terrifying. Yeah. So but anyway, go, going back to like these antitrust hearings with this epic lawsuit. So where is this going, this, this lawsuit? What could happen here? Well, a lot of things could happen. I mean, they just launched it last week. And I mean, again, the lawsuit itself is probably grandstanding. The lawsuit itself won't probably go anywhere because, I mean, they'll get that tied up in the courts for a decade. Right. But this is just mounting pressure on the government, the FTC, or the DOJ in the States. I don't know what's going to happen in Canada. We don't seem to have been taking much of a hand. But they certainly are in Europe. The, the privacy, uh, you know, but actually the, the competition bureau are definitely looking. Like, this is really just throwing fuel and pressure on these fires to have government act. Right, and, and, and here in Canada, it, it is worth pointing out that, like, the Trudeau government has promised that, I think it's next year, they're going to be moving on this set of problems somehow. And it's, it, they, they kind of worded it really ambiguously, but it's yeah. like, they are moving. Oh, yeah. Which way, I don't know, but... We don't know. Although, you know, and that's the one good thing about both the CRTC and the privacy commissioners. Yeah. They see, they're very, they move slowly, but they move very deliberately. Yeah. I, I, there is something that, like, I think the best thing you can say about the CRTC and about the privacy commissioner's office is that we often don't hear about them. So yeah. that means, that, again, that they're not just having some kind of stupid hearing and performing and kind of juggling balls in the air and then making kind of asses of themselves. They're just sitting in the back very data, doing actually, the research, yeah, doing the research. Data and, and doing the work. And I think there are often two kind of institutions in our country that are often underappreciated because we don't hear about them that often, which is what you want to be. So, yeah, I mean, there is stuff happening in Canada. But I think, again, all this, this is not, I mean, on the iOS side, the week before last, there was also Xbox live streaming service was denied access to the App Store because they said, well, if you're running an App Store with it, it's because they have their own, their own game selection. You can't review that. You're basically running, for whatever capricious reasons, they decided Apple. And I think Google basically said the same thing. I mean, right. Again, their app, they have this control. They have these levers. And they're saying, we're going to get our cut. We built these systems. They're ours. And if you run the fruit sand, good on you, then that works. But when you run the largest kind of access to information and software distribution things on the planet, it's like the pandemic. Societal consequences and interests at a certain point, when you get to a certain size, good for you, you made all that money, you got large, that's excellent. But at a certain level, when you get to a certain size, society's interests actually take precedence over the individual company, the individual user. And this is what's going to happen, is that government is going to step in and start regulating. And that would probably, on the one hand, though, there is a certain set of shot for you, like, it would be good to have them, these kind of levers taken away from these large, massive companies. But on the, on that's the, probably the, not the flip side, side like, no it, it's, it's worth pointing out that we were talking a little bit about the history of wiretaps. And yeah. one of the places where wiretap law in the, in the United States was decided was the Telecommunications Act of, I think it was 1994, and yeah. where like they were trying to sort out what exactly happens when you have a data service yeah. and what does it mean to have a data service. Being the internet was still fairly new, they were still thinking about it, but as part yeah. of that, the ability to wiretap was also becoming easier and easier to implement. And so they yeah. have to codify the, the law surrounding that. And it's worth pointing yeah, out. Yeah, the Kelly Act, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Kelly Act. And it, yeah. both of them, very kind of similar era of the Bill Clinton presidency. And one of the points in Donald Trump's book, I think it was uh, the uh, the one that was like called something very close to Make America Great Again. 
Um, oh, Cal. But uh, oh, basically, like... he picked, or at least his ghostwriter, picked that particular law apart and saw, like, right away that there are these problems where, like, it was designed for the time where they really yeah. didn't understand the technology. Now the technology has developed for, by that point, 10 years, now 30 years, uh, and we're at the point where there are social consequences of the compromises that were made 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, and, we, and that's the yeah. and that's the problem with regulation, right? Like, it's it's not that I think too often gets a, it gets boiled down to like government is incompetent or government they don't know what they're doing and they should keep the damn nets off the private interests. But it's not that; it's that a law is a very very specific and very point by point tool that is designed for a very specific use case. Law, I mean, the best laws are in some ways the, the most vague and flexible, but also the worst laws are some, in, in ways the most vague and flexible because they have the ability to be misused. Right. So there's that underlying tension, and because, yeah, as you said, as the technology moves so fast, it's really hard to have laws that address very specific tech. Tech is one of the worst areas because tech, you know, I mean, at least, you know, murder hasn't really changed in the last 5,000 years. Maybe the way in which you commit the crime has, but pretty much the same act. One person's alive, one person's dead. Yeah. Not much has shifted in that. Pretty easy to legislate around that, that set of problems. Tech moves so fast, it's almost impossible to to have meaningful laws that are valid 5, 10, years, 15 years later. So I think my worry, like I said, as much as I would like these app stores to be opened or some kind of other, like, forced systems that have X number of constituent users to allow, let's say, side loading of apps, or, like, and that's not a great solution either. But some well, yeah, because government the, the next step, it. especially with technology, it's easy to create yeah. a, yeah. all right, fine then, our app store will have 999,999,999 yeah. users, and, and if no, you want, yeah, and, and not a yeah. single one more, and if you yeah, want yeah. to use our app store and you're above that limit, then you have to use basically App Store too, right? <laughs> exactly. You uh, you fragment the yeah the problem space. Um, there's all sorts of ways of getting around that. But again, I think the bigger issue is that once you start mandating like, a lot of the way that these security features, like you know, to only allow the code that runs from the App Store on devices, it's it's run through it's developed through code time. So so oh, we're going to pause know, here because we haven't talked too much about code itself. Or code signing. So, so, how would you describe what is code signing? So, code signing is the practice of attaching a digital certificate to a piece of code to verify the integrity of it. It verifies that the code has not been changed since it was signed, like with what's called a digital certificate, and that's just a cryptographic number. That it allows basically that process to be reversed, so that the, the device can guarantee that the same code that was signed by that that long number is the code that's running on the device. It's not been hacked or modified. And again, there are really good legitimate reasons to have these kind of tools. And this is the way that Android and iOS. I'm very very much simplifying it here, so please don't email. Yeah. But it's a very kind of what useful way of deciding what code can and cannot run on device. And this is the way these app stores allow. They make sure that you can't get code that is unsigned onto the device. And I think the problem is going to be if government starts mandating that you have to break kind of code signing walks. That, and I hate the slippery slope argument because, you know, if you start going slippery slope with technology, pretty soon you can't do anything because there might be second order consequences six years down the road. Yeah. And therefore we can't have any kind of regulation. And that's not useful either. But I do worry about kind of government having like starting that precedent of being able to ask that cold signing be disabled because this is what the governments have wanted for a long time and, and not to be conspiracy theory about it. But I mean, intelligence agencies want the ability to get into these types of devices. Right. And it's so not like a long-term um, threat either, right? Like in yeah. Australia today, they yeah. have that power. The reason, They have that power. Yeah. They, they, it, you are not allowed to build unbreakable encryption. Yeah. And it's not that Australia is just some country that is doing this, and it's an exceptional case. No, it Britain is trying to do it. With yeah, their Britain. Digital, uh, the digital privacy, or what is it called? The digital. Oh, I can't remember the name of the act. Yeah, I don't remember the one in Britain either. But, like, the Five Eyes, like, the, the organization, the public face yeah. of Five Eyes has come out and said, we need to do this in all the Five Eyes countries. And that yeah. includes yeah. here in Canada and yeah. in the United yeah. States. 
And so yeah. it's not like a theoretical thing that could possibly no. happen. We just have to worry about it. No, it's being pushed for right now. And it's being pushed for with things like the Earners Act, which I thought was one of your kind of topic listings. Like, I think that kind of provides the segue into that, is that once you start allowing, and again, for a fully legitimate purpose, we want to break up these monopolistic practices by these kind of wall garden app stores, these large dominant companies. But when you start looking at implementation, it does become tricky. It's like, well, do we allow legislation to say, you have to be able to break signed code because that then sets a precedent when that can be then used in other areas. Like, I mean, look at as the other you know, I mean, the DMCA was a really set of interesting compromises, right? Like, we are going to, I mean, and this goes back to Cali and we were talking about 94, like information services and kind of telecommunication services because that's kind of the way that information architectures were split up, right, in the right. states. And that kind of has fallen through to the rest of the world just because of the way the states kind of had fairly nominal control of the internet. Is that you have information services and you have telecommunication services. Well, and, and not, not only nominal control over the internet, but also nominal control over the transmission of laws like the DMCA. Yeah, the, the like discourse the, around it. Right, right yeah. like the, the UN is in the United States. The yeah. Uh, there is, or at least was up until recently, they were the hegemon that decided, not necessarily what all the laws were around the world, but like when international treaties were being negotiated, they would yeah. be negotiated at the UN. And they yeah. would be and, yeah. the WIPO and, and the WTO and all these global organizations, a lot of them were basically ways for interests that were powerful in the United States to express yeah. themselves. And they still do have root control over DNS, so yeah. let us not forget that. So the DMCA was a very kind of interesting set of compromises. Like you can run an information service, and as long as you take kind of illegal content down, you as a provider can't be held responsible for what your users do. And that was a really interesting set of compromises back in '97. I think it was that the, the DMCA came up. 96, 97. Uh, 95. Or no, it was 98. Uh, the DMCA was 98. Oh, okay. um, but the, it was written in a time when the internet was obviously just kind of getting going, and it was kind of to address port boards, and those types of information services, forms, news groups. And the interesting thing, of course, is that then the way that new media companies built themselves was around Section 230, the safe harbor provisions, which is, which is that part of the law that says you, as a service provider, cannot be held, can't be sued, you can't be held responsible for what. You're not providing a guarantee of information. You're not endorsing what your users post. Right. You, are, you are simply providing a platform. And if somebody puts neo-Nazi shit on your platform, yeah, you probably got to take it down, but you can't be held, you can't be sued for it. Right. And there are good things and bad things about this. But what it meant is that the, the next generation of companies that built themselves up, built with that legal architecture and technical architecture is too kind of play in mind. Right. right. And I you think know, a lot of people kind of these days has. will take for granted that this is the way things have always been because the DMCA yeah. has been around for so long by they're, this point. Yeah, and they're not. Yeah. I mean, you look at libel law, you look at newspapers, in a lot of countries, traditional media companies are very, very open to and susceptible to libel suits. And that's why a lot of reporting has, I mean, that's why it's such a long and careful process. I mean, partly because of the stakes. It's like if you print modern information, or at least back in the day when a newspaper actually was more than something to start barbecue with, if you printed information that was incorrect, that was a big deal. Yeah. And, but again, it was also a big deal financially because you could be held liable for that in a lot of places. And the DMCA really shifted that. And it's, again, there were good second order and bad second order consequences of that. but. The point is, is that these laws and then the way that technology kind of moves to fill the gap in the law and work within that kind of constraint framework, that builds the next generation of companies. Like YouTube wouldn't be around, Twitter wouldn't be around, Facebook wouldn't be around. Not, we wouldn't have social media networks if it wasn't for 230. Right. And then the export. And, and then on top of those social media networks, you wouldn't have the Facebook games that are... I mean, I don't even look at them, but I know like they have hundreds of millions of users. You, you wouldn't yeah. have the things that have been built with the assumption that social media websites would be there. News. You wouldn't have, you, you wouldn't have Uber, you wouldn't have Airbnb. There's the entire kind of set of companies that we have now that have grown up to exploit the internet wouldn't be around, you wouldn't have Yelp without those kind of provisions. And what the Earn It Act is trying to do is to threaten to take that away. So if you build a system, I mean, and again, I'm, I'm laying a very, very 
quite a small summary out, but it's like if you build a system with and you provide unbreakable encryption, it's like your 230 exemption, your safe harbor can be taken away by the government. Right. And that isn't some abstract threat. You take 230 away, and that's the end of your business. Game over. Done. You, you, tell, you tell Facebook that they have no more uh, kind of legal immunity to uh, safe harbor 230 protection, company's done. Well, th- yeah, right. f- company's, company's done. done. And then the in addition to that, the functionality of Facebook immediately changes, too. You are now, like, 100% commercials. I mean, the company will die a very quick death. Well, the company dies point. anyway because, you know, you, just, you can't have any user posts. Right. You can't. The feedback that we are used to is just suddenly non existent yeah. there. And again, there are, that's a good thing, it's a bad thing. I mean, social networks, because of 230, have been allowed to spread all sorts of stuff that in a normal functioning media environment would never have gotten traction. And they do it because of engagement numbers, they do it because you can sell ads against anything. It doesn't matter. It's just a piece of content to stick an ad next to. Who cares? So again, there are good and bad sector consequences of this. But this encryption fight, it's being fought. On through the internet apps as well. And, and, I mean, even Trump the other day, when Twitter blocked a couple of his tweets that were shitty, he his immediate go-to was to say, "We're going to re-examine 230." And I think which is it kind of interesting that like they're examining it at the the level of the Trump uh, presidency and probably elsewhere in the U.S. and other go- well, yeah, governments. The but like the point is, like they can threaten to revoke it in a case like that. And they could say, okay, if you don't let the president or the emperor god or whatever do his thing, we're going to revoke this uh, privilege or whatever. But if they do it for that reason, they can't also do it to force I- encryption uh, to be basically taken away or, or all right to, I mean, like they could do both, but like... Sure, but again, the encryption thing, that was just the soft side. Like, right. That's, a, that's something going to Congress. Well, Congress could just say, we are legislating encryption is going away. Right. And now that can be taken to the Supreme Court and it'll be kind of whether, who knows how that would be decided. But they don't need, like that was the soft sell. I mean, I think you put another act that was even worse than Ernest. Um, I think it was in one of the kind of the show notes. Um, and I'm, from, I'm blanking on the moment. But I mean, that was kind of the way that was carried. The stick has yet to come. Because again, technology and especially communications mediums are always in such a precarious position because at the end of the day, the state, or at least right now still, I mean, we, it seems that in some ways technology is hastening the end of kind of the centralization of, of statehood. But in our current kind of legalist kind of framework, you still, the state has that ultimate power. Right, and, and we do get to see it in cases here and there where there are issues where the government's uh, both here in Canada and in the States, do in fact act. And one of them, yeah. I don't want to let this totally slip by, uh, no. but the question of Alberta's Bill 1, that is basically regulating where and when protests can be to basically protect the oil industry. It's the, quote, yeah. Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, where they are making it so that the equivalent of protesting on highways, protesting in oil fields, protesting in forests to prevent loggers from doing their thing, all kinds of protests that used to be commonplace over the history of Canada generally are now sternly and, and strictly criminalized with significant yeah. penalties. With serious consequences. Like very, I mean, very that's the whole point of a protest. You can't have a protest in a controlled from the environment. The whole point of a protest is that it is transgressive. If it's not breaking some kind of ordinance, it's not really having any kind of an impact. And not only is it that critical infrastructure is very amorphously defined, it's that, that the government can basically deem anything as critical infrastructure. They don't have to signpost it. So you also then, it has the, you know, it has the chilling effect of, well, I'm not going to go protest in that field because if the government retroactively says, well, actually, that was critical infrastructure. Now you're in jail for 10 years, buddy. Right. Um, and on top of that, with the current COVID crisis, the Albertan government has made it so that they can pass a law purely based on the word of an individual MLA that is a member of the majority government. So if a MLA up and decides, oh, I'm by this public park that is being used as a peaceful protest, well, I decide this is now essential. And then the other law kicks into effect. And that is, it's, there's so many different ways that this can go wrong. But that, well, I mean, it was intended to go wrong. Like, right. It's intended to inhibit protest. Exactly. And you know what the great thing is with something like this is you never actually have to enforce it. It's the threat of it that's enough. Right. Um, and that, that, that great, I mean, from their standpoint. You'll never have to test it in court. 
because the, the threat of having these potential serious consequences is enough to inhibit, or in a lot of cases will be enough to inhibit protest. And I mean, any time you talk about critical stru- infrastructure legislation or essential services legislation, you know, your hackles have to have to go up. And the other thing too is kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but like it's interesting that there's there is a parallel here in that the question is how responsible can our users or in this case citizens be like in the case of the app stores the question is can we trust our users to just run code that's yeah. been signed or, signed or not in this yeah. case it's looking at alberta from afar it's very easy to come to the conclusion of they have voted in this extremist undemocratic party and they've used their power of vote for the purposes of undoing the civil protections that are necessary yeah. for a free society, yeah, should they right. even have the right to vote anymore? Like, yeah, is that right. the kind of question at this point? Yeah, oh yeah, well, they're definitely trying to quell dissent, they're trying to block any kind of... Let us not forget that protest is legitimate. Like, look, the only way that there was going to be any kind of movement on those rail lines, or like the pipelines, was through blockade of the rails right. like i mean the government has been ignoring indigenous voices for hundreds of years and the only way that there was going to be any kind of movement on this is when you, when you shut stuff down and i mean again i think the question has to also be what is in a functional democracy what is a more legitimate concern for the state economic output or citizen engagement right i certainly would say it's not economic output like, what are we? Are we, a, are we a country whose primary purpose is to grease the economy? Or, or, or are we a country whose primary perhaps to, purpose to, is kind to empower and enable our citizenry? Right, and, and to like more to that effect, I mean, thinking about what pipelines and rail lines basically do is it ships goods from this country to other countries or other regions. And, and then, yeah. from kind of rephrasing that question, is, is the point of having a province or a country or whatever, merely to extract resources for the benefit of someone right. somewhere else, some other well, I mean, yeah. some other civilization, some whatever. Well, I mean, that's the whole point of capitalism, is it, it is an extractive process. And yeah. As long as you can capture that delta between what you can kind of pay your labor costs and what something is worth, you are extracting every, every cent or every drop or whatever or every tree out of an environment. You are typically you are leaving the consequences of those acts, the the uncounted kind of pollution or whatever. You are leaving those behind. You are externalizing as many costs as you can, and you are extracting everything out of that delta in the middle as you can. Right. That that is the way our kind of our system. I mean, that's the, the ugly kind of more nuanced you know, machinations of this glorious thing we call capitalism. Right. And not to say that there is a better system. I don't want to go down. I don't think this is the right podcast to go down that rabbit hole, but. If we at least understand these things about the way these types of systems work, we can then mitigate for them, right? right. Like it's not about railing against and saying, well, these are these these are kind of the functional kind of consequences of this type of a system, and know them and mitigate them, like in the same way that regulation is not meant to be a check on power; it's meant to say, these is this is the functional problem of what happens when a company gets really large; they start to improve, enforce their own. In their own needs at the cost of, let's say, you know, let's go back to tech, their users or the developer community. So we need a check on them because they obviously don't. And that has to be regulation. That has to be government. I mean, it's a virtuous cycle. It's like if everything works properly, your users act as a check on the company and the company acts as a check on developers and the developers act as a check on users. But when you don't have that exchange of stakeholder values when one party has 90 to 95 percent of the power balance i mean in this case if we're talking about this act i mean that's the government you know the government right. says you can't be on this piece of land to to enact a protest to communicate to block transmission let's say you know, whether that's hampering a pipeline or a ddos attack like you can't do this because we've de- deemed that economic output is more important than the voices of our citizenry that's a fundamental problem Right. So in the meanwhile, though, we are, are getting kind of late into the show. So is there anything you'd like to tell the world that, again, now that you have the attention of the listeners uh, to uh, get across? 
I guess so. I'm, and I, I said this last time I was on, and then a year passed, and I was busy with the thesis and didn't actually um, you know, attend to it. But I'm launching a blog where I kind of go into a lot of this, a lot of the implications of, of the tech and the antitrust stuff in particular. Um, and what I'm trying to do, like I'm trying to situate this stuff in a larger historical context. So, yes, looking at the, the nitty gritty of code signing, but also looking at like, these are not problems that are new to the tech scene. Mm-hmm. We've had these same arguments about the phone networks when they were developed. We've had these same kind of arguments of rail networks. I mean, rail companies owned the, the product companies and the distribution markets. Like, these are not new problems, just the types of networks that we're arguing about have changed. You know, whether those are pipelines, electricity grids, railway networks, you know, even just like rights passage to roads back in Old England. Like, right. these, these, these things, they seem new and novel because they are attached to bits and uh, pro- streaming protocols and digital certifications, but there is a lot of useful precedent or at least historical context and, and useful data that can be kind of extracted from the history of communications networks because that's what everything is. As you said, even these, these rail, these pipelines, all they are is basically transmission networks for yeah. something. For value of some kind, rather than that. So, I mean, it's people always say you know, digital things are the, the digital gold, or whatever, which is or digital oil, and it's hyperbolic. But in some levels, it's tapping into kind of fundamental truth. So, I'm hoping to launch this by the end of kind of beginning of September, before kind of school starts back up again for this year, and you know, the weirdness that that will with COVID times. But yeah, I really kind of really look at the, again, the tech companies, antitrust, a lot of the, because again, so much of our lives are now, I mean, this was the case before COVID, but it's even more so now the case post-pandemic and post-social isolating. So much of our world, so much of the way we buy things, the way we consume things, the way we interact with our loved ones, so much of this is mitigated by these little glass devices in our pockets or on our desks. Yeah. And so much of that happens at the network level. Like these are dumb terminals in the waterways. So, so much of that happens in even just the, the contractual agreements between, let's say, Amazon and Apple in the background. Like there's a reason that you can't buy Kindle books on an iOS device. And it's because there isn't 30% of margin to give to Apple in Amazon's business model for books, for ebooks. It's just, you can't get blood out of the snow. And that's just one simple example. But so much of this stuff, because it happens at the network level, because it happens in these, between these large companies, we just see the way you know, users, we see the way things are, and you assume that, well, that's maybe a function of the technology. And in a lot of cases, it's not. It's a functionality of either monopolies or secondary contractual agreements, or just the fact that stuff is happening on the network. Right. And so that's the main kind of thesis of, of what I'm going to be writing about. All right, stuff to look forward to. All right, so in the meanwhile, uh, thank you to all the listeners, and thank you, Devin, for participating today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a very illuminating discussion. For sure. And and just as a reminder, uh, this is a listener-supported show, so you can go to subscribestar.com slash jeff-cliff, and yep. uh, hopefully that will allow this kind of conversation to continue to exist. Go oh, I should have mentioned, the, the website is theband.dev. Awesome. And hopefully when that goes live, we'll yeah. be able to bring more eyeballs in your direction as well. So will be excellent. Leave out without the uh, goodbye song today, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>